Today's video is sponsored by Energy Sage. Check out the new Energy Sage heat pump marketplace today to reduce your home's heating bills, kick fossil fuel furnaces to the curb, and get verified trustworthy professionals to help you move your home heating and cooling system out of the 19th century and into the 21st. For those who've been keeping track of time and have been watching this channel for a while, you might know that we moved into this house where the studio is in 2019. At the time my wife and I purchased this home, our teenage daughter was still at home, so the 2,000 and some square foot house and double car garage on one third of an acre seemed like a great fit. I got a lovely large room, this room, as a craft room. My wife and I shared an office just across the hall for the times we wanted to just work from home or game at the weekend, and we both commuted to and from our respective offices, she in downtown Portland and I in Hillsborough, Oregon. Then COVID-19 happened. Everyone started working from home and everyone started questioning what on earth we were going to do with our lives. Our small office ended up becoming a permanent place of work and we made the tough decision to move out of our transport evolved office space and go 100% remote. Because, you know, it is more important to pay your staff than have a fancy studio space nobody can actually safely go to work at. At that point, our dream home here in the foothills of the coast range became something of a little cramped. The transport evolved servers were moved into our family media server rack next door. The craft room, this room, became the TE filming studio and a storeroom for all of our camera gear. And my wife and I found that our shared office space was challenging to both work in at the same time, especially when we both had to have in-person Zoom meetings. Worse still, this house, which was heated by old-fashioned cadet heaters, was a little on the cold side in the winter, as well as quite expensive to heat, and in the summer... Well, we, we had to cool the house down using portable AC units that were not particularly efficient or indeed safe because we traipsed cables across the hallways to bathroom sockets to stop them tripping the breaker. Yeah, this home electrical system was not intended for a full server rack or indeed an office space with multiple high-powered computers running in it at the same time. Ah server room, the closet at the top of the stairs next door, overheated constantly. In the winter we had to keep the door open to keep air flowing into and out of the room. The noise was horrible. In the summer we had to set up extra fans on the hallway to keep air flue moving so that the servers didn't overheat and shut down. That was even louder. And when you are spending thousands of dollars on hard drives to keep your business running smoothly, and then asking those hard drives to keep working in temperatures in a space with an ambient temperature in excess of 110 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 43, 44 degrees Celsius, you know you have a problem. So, last spring, after our daughter had moved out of the house to her own place on her 18th birthday the previous summer, my wife had claimed her own workspace in my daughter's former bedroom, and we'd installed a 15 kilowatt peak solar array on our roof, we decided to make the switch to more efficient heating and cooling solutions for our home. We purchased not one, but two heat pumps. Last year, I detailed what our first few weeks of use was like, and now it's time to give you an update, detailing how the heat pumps have performed over the winter, discussing a couple of problems we've had, and letting you know what's next for our home. In this video, I'm going to assume that you're all reasonably familiar with how heat pumps work. Instead of heating up an electrical element to produce heat or burning a fossil fuel to do the same, they move heat energy from outside of your home to inside to warm your home in winter and vice versa to cool it in the summer. They use compressor technology that, at a fundamental level, is a bit like the system that keeps your refrigerator and fridge freezer operating, but instead of working in just one direction, they're capable of bi-directional operation. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs here because Alec over at Technology Connections has made a really amazing series of videos about heat pumps that I'll link to below. I guess it also makes sense for me to quickly reiterate to you the reasons we decided to go for not one but two heat pumps for our home because most normal homes only ever need one. In your average run-of-the-mill house, you'll ideally want to keep the rooms warm in winter and cool in summer. So 
You don't need multiple systems as long as everyone likes a similar temperature range at the same time of year and no one is a lizard person. But in this house we have, just over there off camera, a closet that's been turned into a server room with many servers. And during the summer they need cooling and in the winter, because that room is also very tiny, they also need cooling. Less cooling, but cooling nonetheless. While there are heating systems available on the market that can move heat energy from one room to another, something that would effectively allow us to use excess heat from the server closet to heat our home in winter, they aren't traditionally installed in residential applications, require a lot of extra faffing around to install, and frankly, they are more expensive than just having two separate systems. Simply put, it was basically cheaper for us to install two conventional heat pumps than it was to install one fancy all singing all dancing one, so that's the way we went. It also provides us with backup cooling for the server room in the terrible event that the dedicated server room AC unit dies. Which it did, back in September, when I and the team were on our way to Fully Charge Live in San Diego. A small mouse had decided that the smaller of our two heat pumps was the perfect place to build a little nest for the winter while the power was off because of high winds and forest fire risk. When the power company had decided the risk of forest fires had passed and turned our power back on, the mouse, which had a brand new home, also quickly no longer found itself alive and its decapitated body found itself blocking up the fan, thus causing the unit to stop working. It was gross. Yes, we also now have a regular pest control expert that visits the house, and no, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Anyway, our system, as installed in the spring of last year, had its first winter, and I'm here to tell you that it was a mixture of up and down. While the system behaved perfectly in the summer, we had some issues in the winter that caused some headaches and higher than expected electricity bills. For some reason, the system continued to heat well beyond the set temperature limit, making the house extremely hot and forcing us to switch into cooling cycles. That is not normal heat pump behaviour and in our case was traced to two different things by the installers, who by the way, are nothing to do with today's video sponsors. It turned out that Mitsubishi units have a bug in them that can cause them to basically lock into one particular mode of operation if multiple units in the home that are connected to the same outdoor heat pump are asking for different things. That bug couldn't easily be reproduced and the only way to reset the system at that point was to completely turn off the heat pump at the breaker, wait a while and then turn it back on. The second issue was that our units didn't seem to be sensing temperatures properly, partly because we'd not kept the filters in every indoor unit as clean as we should have done, and partly because of the unit's design. Learning the proper maintenance has helped us solve that problem immensely. Connected to this, because our heat pump indoor units all operate on the same main branch, they would continue to push air into the room after the set temperature was reached. This one was harder to diagnose, but one of our installers ended up talking to Mitsubishi's top engineering team and our system needed to have a special modification, snipping a resistor, I'm not joking, to make it work properly. I'm not going to blame our installers though because our system is particularly difficult and also because I've been researching online since our system was installed and we started to have problems and it seems other people have had the same kind of issues with Mitsubishi Hyperheat systems. They've all been a bit weird. The biggest of those being higher rather than lower heating bills. And that was us. For the first two months of the winter, our electricity bill was markedly higher than in the previous winter with the old heating. And at first we did blame our heat pumps. However, it does turn out that my wife, who had spent a lot of the pre-holiday season in an uninsulated workshop running a six kilowatt fan heater for literally days at a time, was partly to blame for that high bill as was the quirky nature of our home installation and the need to modify it for our specific needs. That, and what we still think is a broken Ford home integration system, yeah, there are more videos coming on that too, a well pump that 
a month before it finally died, started constantly running and spilling water over our yard and we didn't notice, and it required a costly replacement, as well as a broken timer for our water heater that we didn't think was broken, until I noticed that the timer on it wasn't at the correct time, moved the dial and then we lost all hot water. That makes it hard to pinpoint exactly what was the cause of the extra high electricity bills, but I think all of those things played a part. Suffice to say, with the water timer replaced, the well pump fixed, and our heating engineers back to tweak things, our heat pump experiences have been better. Our last electricity bill was a few hundred dollars less after everything was fixed, so fingers crossed that continues. I'm going to tell you more of the benefits as I've seen them thus far of our system, but first, a new exciting update from today's video sponsors, Energy Sage. If you are a long-time viewer of this channel, you'll know that Energy Sage is a long-standing partner of this network, helping you and other homeowners across the US connect with local, verified solar installers who really know their stuff and can help you navigate the process of installing photovoltaic solar panels on the roof of your home, or help you join a local community solar project. But Energy Sage has just launched its own heat pump marketplace too, helping you use the same hassle-free online quotation system it developed for solar systems for home heat pump installations as well. Just like Energy Sage's solar site, the heat pump marketplace from Energy Sage is packed with information you'll want to know about making the switch to a heat pump system for your home, covering things like basic terminology, the different systems available, and incentives for making the switch, as well as what to expect when you get a heat pump system installed in your home. And of course, it also helps you get verified quotes from local installers in your area, so no horrid door-to-door -door salespeople are in sight. Follow the link in the description to sign up for Energy Sage's free, no obligation heat pump marketplace service today. And if you do choose to use an Energy Sage installer for your new home heat pump system, we will get a small referral fee, so you will be helping us out too. So that out of the way, let's get to the good bits. First, it is really nice to have a heating system that is quiet, doesn't make weird fan noises emanating from the wall, and doesn't smell bad for the first few weeks of winter. All of our units are either wall or ceiling mounted, and because they're placed high up, we've actually gained, rather than lost, wall space, because the cadet heaters were all placed at a fairly low height. Except my special cadet heater, which I'm showing you right now. Don't worry, it, it's not a real heater, but it really scares visitors to the house. Check out Vent Dragons, they're cool. Next, since our heating installers tweaked our system to function properly, our downstairs family space has been warm for the first time since we moved in. It's open plan downstairs and that room has always felt a little on the cool side. Now it actually keeps us warm in winter and cool in summer, so it's great. Sometimes, in fact, I also find myself turning off the family room unit when I work out because I don't like warm air blowing on me while I'm working out. But like I say, other than that, it's good. We've also had a dramatically reduced number of stink bugs enter our house in the last year. If you don't know what a stink bug is, just be glad. It, it's basically the entomological equivalent of a skunk in the form of a medium-sized beetle. They overwinter in warm spaces and love to get through cracks in windows or doors, and if you disturb them, they produce this horrid smell that just lingers for weeks. Prior to getting a heat pump, they came in when our windows were open in early autumn and... You can imagine, yeah. It's also really good knowing that our risk of having a fire is dramatically reduced because there's no heating elements hidden in the wall that could cause a nearby misplaced dog toy or a piece of clothing catching fire. And finally, because our heat pump systems use less electricity on paper than an old cadet heater, we reclaimed a few spaces in our electrical distribution panel, which was honestly really good because we needed them. You'll also note that I said on paper, because honestly right now I still don't have the final energy consumption recordings for the units versus our whole house as a whole. And until we insulate our garage properly, read my wife's woodworking shop, I can't blame our higher than usual electricity bill on the heat pumps alone, because this is also the first winter where we had that big shop heater in use for extended periods of time, because my wife made everyone's Christmas presents this year out of wood. She was in the shop a lot. Previously, we'd had two small shop heaters that used far less electricity, 
but didn't actually do any heating, so she was cold while turning wood. As they say though, that again is for another video, as will be further updates on our heat pump system, our Ford home integration system, and hopefully the span panel. We are gonna be making a video on the span panel soon. We think this heat pump system has saved us some money compared to our cadets. It's far nicer in the summer, and working from home is certainly more pleasant without massive temperature changes. So honestly, I think it's a win all in all. And on that note, we are done with today's video. Stick around until after the credits to know more about the classic lampshade G4 iMac behind me. If you liked this video, you know what to do and feel free to let us know your thoughts in our Discord chat room by reaching out to us on Mastodon. Or if you are in fact a Patreon supporter already, leave a comment on our Patreon page. If you want to, please subscribe, hit the bell, and you can also follow those links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. So, you know, you can leave nice comments. You'll also find links to our Kofi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Go on, join the Woolly Mammoth crew. Woolly Mammoth for the win. Scrolling on my right is a list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go out to our self-driving tier supporters. They are Mike Weeder, Danny Hyde, Linda Irish, Alain Schlal, Mark Eckleton, Cyprien Laplace, John Trammell, Alan Tupper, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Sean Tucker, Pedro Mora Pinheiro, Kyle Hodgson, Tony Moss, Brophy Wolf, Kyle Fox, Hey Esker, Tazla in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stefan Framgen, Stephen Williams, Ray Jean Fellows, Chris Center and Jim Burness, and finally, out of this world, thanks to our top tier supporters John L. Henderson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, John Lyons, Kevin Burrowbridge, Andrew Glenn, Joe Hughes, Dave Kitchen, Joe Bresney, Nigel S., Matthew Drobnak, Eric Knack, Paul Conway, Stephen O'Donoghue, JP Fagerback, Reggie Watts, Marcel Ward, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Rory Litwin, Ellery Hensley, Will Graylin, and last but not least, Ian. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on this channel on Main, plus our Sunday Musing and Chicken and Garden over on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. This is the smallest of the classic G4 iMacs that were made. You will remember it because they did that whole Pixar animation thing in the advert and that's no coincidence because Pixar had a connection to Apple back in the day and so it was an obvious connection to make and I still love that advert. I think it's some of the best advertising that Apple's ever done, the G4 iMac, especially the one, uh, there was one advert where they had this little girl going up against a shop window and she stuck her tongue out at that machine and they animated the uh, CD-ROM tray coming out which comes out just above the keyboard there and it looks like it's sticking out its tongue. I'm very silly, but I don't care.